On today's podcast, we have my incredible guest, Doug Fulkins. Doug is a signed artist and professional songwriter with Nashville publisher Lynn Gann Music Enterprises. More than 130 plus of his songs have been recorded by artists in the U.S. and Canada, along with 70 plus radio singles and multiple film and TV placements, including NBC's The Voice. Doug co-writes with many Nashville hit makers and recognized Canadian artists such as Aaron Goodman, Don Amaro, Buck 20, and Haley Benedict. Building off the success of his recent single, I Can't Blame Her, Doug is hitting the airways with his up-tempo, blue-collar, working town song, Six Pack Town. We are going to talk about all of that today as you guys welcome my guest, Doug Falkins. Doug, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. Oh, uh, so good to be here with you here today, Tim. Uh, thanks for having me on. And uh, I'm, I'm, I mean, we got lots to talk about because I'm excited about what's happening in uh, your world and <laughs> what's going on with your music. Well, see, we are, we are going to have a little tidbit about that as well, and I can't yeah, wait to talk yeah. about that. But first off, before we begin today, first, your resume is impeccable, Doug. Congratulations on the release of Six Pack Town. Now, can you take us back to your childhood, where Doug yeah. came from? Yeah, I grew up in New Brunswick on a, on a farm uh, in rural New Brunswick, a little town called Sussex. is the closest town, but we, you know, we were, uh, you know, we, you might consider us us poor. We, you know, it was a gravel road. We had a party line, and we had an outdoor toilet till I was six. So it was wow, kind of a, a um, you know. Uh, um, but we didn't know as kids, we had no idea that we were poor. We we're just like, yeah, it's like, everybody's like that. But, um, you know, that's just the kind of area we grew up in. And, uh, I graduated from there and I went to university in, in Fredericton, university of New Brunswick and got a, a forestry degree. And, um, yeah. And from, from there, after I got my degree, I came, all the work was in the West in, in British Columbia. And I've been here ever since on Vancouver Island. What, what drew you to BC right off the bat? Like, was it the work or was it the scenery? It, Part of it was the work and the challenge because, you know, at that point, that was what I was pursuing. I wasn't pursuing music. I was pursuing my, what I got my degree for. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, this is where all the big trees were. And I hadn't, you know, growing up in New Brunswick and we had, we had, my dad had the farm, but we also had wood lot. So he, he we, were, we were a Christmas tree farm and we were wood log and sell firewood and, you know, grew up in, in, in logging and that kind of that end of it. But, you know, the, to come to where, the Rocky mountains are, and you know, the coastal mountains and, and all these, these giant trees that we said, it was exciting for me to come out and, and work on the coast. Um, and, and, you know, I didn't know anything about British Columbia other than what I'd saw on, you know, TV shows like the beach combers and danger yeah. Bay. Like, you know, like, so it was a very romanticized kind of place. And, uh, I mean, it's beautiful. There's no doubt it's beautiful, but you know, there's nothing like the TV shows. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Fair enough. Now, what about your music aspect? Where did the, at what point did your music start to speak to you? Um, it's funny. I'm, I was really late bloomer in getting into music. Like my grandmother played organ and there was always some people kind of come over with banjos and guitars on us kids. My parents didn't play music, mm -hmm. um, but they'd have friends that come over and I was always kind of fascinated by that. But when I got in university, I had a roommate um, who, who could play guitar and it was really good. And, and I basically just forced him into teaching me like, so he had a old classical guitar that he just let me beat on mm -hmm. and really stretch my fingers out on like the wall, they have wide press, I mean, easy to press the strings, but it was, you really had to stretch. And essentially, you know, he taught me a few chords and then I just played and played and played and, and was terrible as you, everybody is when they start out, but completely determined. And in hand in hand with that, I, I became determined to write songs almost immediately because oh, wow. I was a creative writer. Like in, in high school, I was either I, I was good in science and good in, in English and, and history. Mm -hmm. So I, I was at that juncture where I was going to take forestry or I was going to go into uh, classics. I was going to be a historian or something, but I was, I was a good writer. Fair but enough. I ended up taking what my parents wanted because they want a job that actually can pay some money. So, so they pushed me the that bills way. A little bit would be but, nice. Yeah. So it was so great when I discovered music that I could actually tap into that, that writing thing again. And uh, so I started writing terrible songs instantly. Um, as we all do. As we all do. And then with, with that is like, there was a bunch of little folk clubs uh, at that time, folk music, like, like the open stages were all kind of folky. Mm 
mm-hmm. like Great Big C was huge. Um, so I really got into that style of music and going to these folk clubs and then going up and playing my own songs and people were like smattering of applause. And I remember when I learned to play, I think the first song that I covered that people actually really liked was like Drunken Sailor, you know, oh, and like, yeah. oh, they're all, oh, this is great. You know, because you actually had a crowd pleasing song. That was, I finally learned to play something that wasn't one of my own. <laughs> <laughs> But, but uh, you also get addicted to that, too. You, mm-hmm. you get addicted to the stage. You get addicted to that response. And at the same point, I was writing songs and getting better. But, you know, that was that was kind of how I got my joy and, and, and finding a spark for being a, a creative musician. Oh, right on. Are there any musicians who inspire you? And what kind of qualities yeah. do you admire about them? Yeah, I mean, I I think for me, um, the 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 big the big guy right now for sure in the last probably five years has been Jason Isbell um, on, on lots of different levels. I mean, first of all, just the integrity of, of him as a human being and what he stands for and uh, what he what he stands up and says and the yeah, positions one he takes. That's actually not afraid to speak his mind, right? Like, he's not afraid to speak his mind, um, and he's not afraid to speak his mind because of the other things that he has going for him. Is it because he's so thoroughly versed in his musicianship and his songwriting um and he has this massive following without ever breaking through to the mainstream but anybody who was in music knows who he is exactly yeah. you know like 20 years ago everybody talked about the band called little feet like you know that's who the musicians all if they had anybody play a band a, a show for them they would hire little feet yeah. you know and but but little feet was never really known they had like you know couple songs that you may have heard of but 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 jason isbell he's taking it to a whole new level where like he's the songwriter songwriter he's a musician's musician Mm -hmm. and he's the um you know he stands up for the little people or or the 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 unpopular i guess i don't know if it just aligns with how i think i guess so so I, i i have a lot of respect for for him as a musician um the other person I would mention to you is just, just from a lyrical, you know, he's a lyrical assassin. The other lyrical assassin is Tennille Towns. She's oh. just, she just, she just slays everything she does. Yeah. She slays her performance. You know, she's four foot nothing from Grand Prairie, Alberta. And, um, you know, she's, uh, I, I remember when her name wasn't Towns, like it was, right. <laughs> we, we met, we met, you know, and, and she just achieved so much and it's because of, um, her drive, um, you know, she's really, she gives so much to charity and ties into these like big charitable organizations in Grand Prairie year after year since she was like 16. Yeah. And um, yeah, so she inspires me as well. So Yeah, she she's one of those people that sees the world a whole lot differently than yeah. most of the others do. Mm-hmm. And, and it shows in her writing. It's impeccable every time. Yeah, you know, um, and I'm glad she's finding the success that she ha- she is right now you know mm-hmm. it's um it's a fleeting thing sometimes but i think those those artists like jason and and Tenille have the um the integrity mm-hmm. to last um you know someone described to me uh, that your moment in the sun is kind of like uh is like you get this prism or you know diamond and, and the sun's shining through it and it spins just the right way and it's going to land on you Mm-hmm. for two seconds because it's still spinning and that's going to go on someone else's it's their turn it may never come back to you but um you know you, you accept that success when it comes and understand that it may be fleeting but um but there are some artists like that you i think are have got um you know the legs in the long term at least w- from a respect standpoint may not may not always be on the number one on the chart or whatever it might be but yeah but, uh, but yeah. you'll still have your name there Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, one hundred percent. Like, like there's a couple even in Canadian country music, like Emerson Drive. Haven't mm-hmm. seen a number one from them, but everybody knows who Emerson Drive is. Of Doc, course, yeah. Doc Walker, like, yeah. Yeah, I mean, these are these are the they're still on your playlist, right? Yeah, <laughs> so they're, it's a, they're, they're the pioneers. Mm. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, it, the beautiful thing about our industry, we can go way back. Like, <laughs> go, <Right>? go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I think I think you know. Uh, I think of Hank Snow because uh, it's really funny. I was digging my 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 um my dad. My mom found these things, and it was a a program from Hank Snow's tour. Uh, and and my grandfather took my grandmother to go see him in Moncton, New Brunswick. So wow. back it was in the fifties. So for him to get to Moncton, uh, even today's 
like an hour and a half drive. But mm-hmm. back then he would have had maybe a car. I don't know. He, <laughs> it would have been a, it would have taken him a whole day and probably yeah. a, a month of work to save up to, to go and see Hank Snow. And, but that was important for him to go see Hank Snow. And so I had the old programs, the, 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 the singing ranger, they called them. <laughs> so, you know, he's a, it was kind of really cool to see, uh, you know, he, he's the only Canadian in the country music hall of fame. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In, in Nashville, so it's kind of cool. That's impressive. Now, we've talked about other songwriters, sir, but now your songwriting is also quite impeccable. Your roster of co-writers is quite substantial. Can you can you take us through a songwriting session for you? Like when you're yeah. waking up in the morning and you're doing a songwriting session, what's going through your mind in there? Okay, well, well that's, a, that's a really good question. I mean, I've been doing it a long time and, and there is similar approach to everybody but it is a little different depending on who i'm writing with um so there's different what i call different types of rights so okay. um if if i'm writing with you and mm-hmm. you're an artist first of all okay you're an artist versus there's writing with an artist versus writing with another writer or yeah. uh and there's also the objective of are we writing for the market? Like often with, with other writers, you just write something that's going to be down the middle or a target, or you hear that there's a uh, Blake Shelton's looking for a song and it's going to mm. be this thing. And so we're going to try to tailor a song to fit that pitch. Fair so, enough, yeah. um, but if it's an artist like yourself, I was like, well, what can we do to get on your next album? Okay. Mm. Or your next cut? Like that's, that's what we're going for as a writer. Uh, we want to be creative, but we also, uh, we're professionals. So we need to, get some revenue and the compensation for our time and our professional expertise. So we want to kind of make a win-win. So what can we do? What can I bring to the table with you that's going to fit your needs? Mm -hmm. So I would do some research on the artists, find out, you know, what kind of style are they? Are they looking for an up-tempo? Like I'd ask these questions though, too, like just get a little back bit of background. And um, so in some cases I might, I'm always writing down stuff on my phone for what I call hooks, yeah. titles, song titles. So, and <clears throat> I may go through that ahead of time and find things that might be tailored that might fit what I think is going to be there. We're going to look for an up tempo. We're looking for a love song, or is it a breakup song, or is it a whiskey drinking song, or is it, you know, kind of find things that's going to fit. So, there's a lot of thought that happens prior to turning on the Zoom session, <laughs> right? Yeah. But it's part of being prepared. And in some, <clears throat> some people, like I'll have song starts. Mm-hmm. I may have a verse and a, and a chorus. I may have some melody lines. I may not bring them to that, but I, you know, I've got to have stuff in the bank yeah. for when that's ready. So days that I don't have a, a co-write, I'll be working on something like that. And, and uh, so <clears throat> that's the, the prep. And then the, then the, the, the right starts. So yeah. <laughs> maybe there's yourself and I and, and somebody else. Generally it's, it's the really cool thing is that you got to hang a bit. You got to like, talk what's the mood what's on people's minds what are they up against like because sometimes a song even though how much prep you got done you you use none of it because of what happens in the room and you have to um pay respect to uh the vibe of the room it's really really critical to uh have the antenna up (laughs) because you never know when that inspiration is going to come um you know inspiration comes all <laughs> like it's kind of funny um someone asked paul simon like yeah uh, uh you know you write a song every day mm-hmm. you, you, yeah it's every day of the year he writes a song at nine o'clock yes yes i do since when does the inspiration come he says well every day at nine o'clock because i'm <laughs> writing <laughs> if i waited for inspiration to come i'd never write songs <laughs> so you, you know it's it's about diligence and just going and doing it so when i say inspiration but i mean Sometimes the song idea is going to be in the room and you got to, you got to just, just, just acknowledge that. You can never know when the hook's going to show up. Exactly. And, and sometimes the hook won't show up for a while. You may be working on something and you realize, Hey, you know, that actually isn't the hook that we have a twist on this. And then that may end up being the, being the actual hook. Absolutely. But once you decide on uh, the vibe or what's needed and, and uh, it, then, it, then it is usually a title and a hook. And then once you have that title, it's like, you got to game it out how many how do you see that the the title is one thing the hook is what does it mean and how how does that how does that impact the listener mm-hmm. like find different ways of you know twist it around um what they call uh, uh brett baxter calls it, it's like a you know song title challenge so you yeah. take that song title and find all the different ways you could write that song title and still make a viable song mm-hmm. 
So that's that's really what the, the we're talking about that the hook. The hook means how is it going to make an impact? Yeah, part of it. So absolutely. So once that's gamed out, and if I settle down on yeah, this is the strategy. Um, it doesn't always happen, but I like to work on the chorus first because the chorus is 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 the money, and it's uh, mm-hmm. <clears throat> my little strategy is everything in the chorus points to the title or to the hook. Okay. Yep. And then you go back and write the verses and all the verses need to do is just point to the chorus. Yep. And then your song's always going to make sense because everything is relevant to the title. Everything's relevant to the hook versus point to the chorus, chorus points to the hook. Mm-hmm. And you know, that way it's going to make sense. Um, yeah. So that's kind of the typical process. And then we'll go through and, and people will be singing it, making voice notes. You got to record what happens is you record that, uh, get the melody for the chorus if you don't record it you'll start remember you'll start writing the verse singing a verse melody and you forgot what the chorus was and then you know you just wasted a bunch of time so always try to have a stop and take a voice note of what it's supposed to be Fair enough. It'll save good. you some time later yeah good input on that because i yeah i've i never even thought about that too but i've had times where i've written a song and then i'll come back to it a couple days later and i'll be like that yeah. wasn't the melody that i had oh no, yeah no. and then i'll be like wait how where the hell did that end up going mm-hmm. yeah and and it's important if you can like when you're done is try to make make a work tape even it's as rough as you know just rough get it mm-hmm. down because <clears throat> If you try to do it again the next day, it's like uh, the, the moment's gone or the tempo is gone. And yeah. Or the I, I often, gone. Yeah, I often yeah. find that I get work tapes from artists like a week later and it's like, why is this so slow? Like, the, the, or, you know, whatever, whatever it is, there's, it wasn't, it just, it isn't the same as what the, the vibe that was going on at the time. So fair though. Now, you've also worked with some pretty acclaimed songwriters like Aaron Goodman and Donna Merrow and Haley Bennett. Yeah. How do you get in touch with these artists to do it? Do you have your management team take care of that? Or is that um, Oakland's reaching out? No, at this point I'm doing all the, all that stuff, but um, I mean, it, this is a really long, like it's a good question, but it's a long question because um, it doesn't happen overnight. Mm-hmm. Like I've been doing it a long time, but <clears throat> when I, you know, I started out, I started to, you have to get credibility in order for people to answer you or even for you to, actually kind of earn the right to ask yeah. for a co-write you know you can't i just can't call up you know gore bamford and say hey will you write a song with me he doesn't yeah. know who i am like you gotta have a track record you need to have some 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 reason a reason why they would want to spend time with you and write a song with you when they could be writing with you know phil barton or whatever yeah. it might be so, you, so you, exactly mm-hmm. so uh it, it really comes down to economics um but and, and track records so you start off and you, you're going to start writing songs that 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 are terrible uh, but eventually they get better and you get some demos you get some cuts and once you start getting some cuts you get into better rooms you might get a publishing deal and that that really helps a lot like when i got my publishing deal in 2014 a lot of doors started opening up and when i would go to nashville they lynn did set up a lot of those rights but then I'm able to leverage that from Canada. It's like, you know, once you have a publishing deal, you can you can call or you can – it doesn't necessarily have to have a publishing deal. Just You can also just have really good songs, mm-hmm. be a good hang. Like, this is really important. Like, people want to hang out with you. The word gets around, yeah, you know, that's that's fun. Because mm-hmm. no matter how good you are, if you're like a, a pain to work with, yeah. And no one really likes that. You know, it's like, ah, I don't want to work with a whiner. Just I don't want someone complaining all the time. Geez, I'm not making enough money and this and that. So, you, you know, part of it is about your attitude, um, track record, and then the, the, the skills and what you can bring to the table. So um, <clears throat> if, if you don't have those things, or you just think about what you can bring. It's, it's, it's a matter of like, think about the person on the other side and, and why would they want to write with you? So the questions like getting to like Aaron Given, and the other thing is I traveled around and went to start going to CCMA events yeah, or BCCMA yeah. events, meet people face to face, like Don and Mero, we were on a writer's round together. So he heard my songs. I heard his songs. We talked after it. Hey, you know, I think we, that would work out. So get out, play. Like um, Haley, I went to a come of her show, or, uh, one of her showcases. She was in a, somewhere in Alberta showcase. Went, checked out her set. Hey, talked to her after. Buck 20 was the same way. I went to a showcase, gave them my card, nice. talked to them, get to know them. So like that's that's kind of, uh, you know, show some respect and go out to their showcase. See, and um like my, you know, my wife, Brenda, when she comes to these things too, she, 
she's my uh does the same thing like a we split up sometimes she'll go to showcase and see who she thinks is really good and give out a card so you can have people work in your team and like try to help you yeah. get those co-writes and um the other thing, you can watch online things like what dave woods is doing within the country mm-hmm. like be part of those rounds watch those rounds find out like you know hey that that, that person's really got something going on that, that clicks with me and maybe maybe you send them a dm and say hey i saw your thing on dave's you know i really like that song and 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 um pay attention to what uh what they're singing and mm-hmm. so i i i know um i know you're gonna ask me about advice and stuff but um one of the early pieces of advice that i got about approaching people is uh i'm gonna it's called the sandwich technique okay so it's imagine if you're writing an email the first part of the email is a big thick chunk of bread that's hey i checked out your new single sounds really good it's it's about them you 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 mm-hmm. and in the middle there's a little slim bit of the jam of yeah. what you're asking for Okay, is your ask. And then the bottom is more bread about, hey, good luck with this. I hope you get the right song that you're working on. It's about them again. So it, the ask is a sandwich ask. It's mostly focused on the on them. And you have your little thing in the middle, right? So um, that's how I think though that kind of technique where you're putting the other person first and you're offering something in return, like that's that's how you get, get into better rights. Um, that is a perfect analogy for that yeah so that is perfect now we've also been sitting here but what's the one of the biggest moments you've had in a songwriting session i don't know that's that I, that's a tough question because you know in a session itself there's i mean i've written hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of songs so i, I can't really specify one of those but i i um I will tell you about a moment that I, that I, I cherish as a moment is um. So, I was in uh, I was in Nashville. I was meeting with this publisher, um, Butch Baker, and Butch ran Hori Pro for a bunch of years. He was an artist himself mm-hmm. and signed with Warner and uh, toured all through the U.S. But super nice guy, and I got a got a meeting with him, so I got to spend like half an hour or something with him. And, and I, I remember coming into the the office, and you sat there in the chair, and there's all kinds of people buzzing around, and writer rooms going. And I got in to meet with Butch and. Uh, Super nice guy. I listened to uh, you know a couple songs and we talked and and uh, he really was impressed. And then when he when it was time to leave, he opened up the office door and we walked out and he says, "Hey everybody, stop what you're doing. I want you to introduce you to Doug Falcons. This is, this man's a songwriter." And and like for me that was a big moment is because it was just the validation from somebody who knows all these writers like to be recognized as that you are a songwriter at that level that. Nashville recognizes yeah. a songwriter. So it's not, I don't know, it's kind of weird saying this because it's like a humble brag thing, but it's like um that was a moment that was meant something to me. It's pretty yeah. special. Oh, one hundred percent To have that gratitude from somebody that's been there and done that. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, not not that we had made a deal or anything like that. It was just that was just the the result of the meeting. So it was kind of fun. But yeah. And he let you know the doors open. I can I and once in a while I'll just call him up and we can chat and stuff. So he's a, mm-hmm. he's one of the good one of the good guys. So, that is, wow. I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall in that. Uh, <laughs> I think you just were because I don't. <laughs> that was about as long as the conversation really was, right? Yeah, there. exactly. Yeah, it was, was a, wasn't much more than that, but it was to me, it meant a lot. So, fair enough. Now, not only are you an incredible songwriter yourself, Doug, but you're quite the country artist as well. Just recently releasing Six Pack Town. The tune is upbeat and fun, a party tune anthem, if I can say so myself. But I want to strip it down. Where did Six okay. Pack Town come from? Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a good question. I, um, I write with the guys from Buck 20. I've been writing with those guys for maybe mm-hmm. three, three and a half years. And we have a standing writing appointment every second Thursday. So we're always creating content. And Fair enough. some of it we pitch and some of it, they have on their kind of hold pile. And I mean, ultimately I'd like to write a hit for those guys, but um, to this day, Mike came in and he had the first line or part of the first line. He had like that flatbed Duramax um, tool chest in the back. I think it's all it really kind of had. He had like, you know, part of it. And we were like, Oh, I really love the way that sounded. And the cadence of it was really fun. Um, So then 
like I said, I went to my phones. I was, oh, I got this title. I went through and looking at some titles. And I had this title called Six Pack Town because that cadence, uh, that whole idea, like this working truck, mm -hmm. right? Working mm -hmm. truck. And then it's like, well, maybe we can make this a working town song. And that's kind of where it came out. It's like this whole little, little line he had is like, this is a work truck. It's not, it's not a flashy <laughs> pickup truck. This is, you yeah. know, we you got the you, we all see them. That's the dualies and the <laughs> you know my truck sitting uh, outside is a work truck. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So so and, and um you know I worked in all these little logging towns uh up the coast. I I was um I'm a forester, so I would go in little camps like 50 people. I lived in a, a place with called Holberg with 50 people for four years. You know, it was 45 minute gravel to get to a grocery store. And uh and then other little places. So it's like, but it's, it's very similar to anywhere else in Canada. It's like, you know, people work hard five o'clock, they, they grab their beer or wherever it might be and yeah. be happy where they live and happy with the life that they got, you know, it's just That's kind of a well-deserved beer at the end of the day. It's not about a big party, but you know, there's a party element to the song, but really the, the uh, underlying theme of the song is that this is a blue collar song. It's a working mm -hmm. town song. So, so from there, um, we had the idea and then we come up with this little hook around the, 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 the lyrical hook around six pack town with like a six pack we got started to do doing the count back, you know, it's so a five o'clock six pack town came first away. So now we have five o'clock six pack town. So what if we could take it all the way down to one? Yeah. So, so that's how we kind of strung that together. And that took, took about 20 minutes or half an hour just to kind of back and forth and finding the right things that fit. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, I don't. Then we, 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 the rest of it kind of just that, just fell in, and then there's a bit of rewriting, but that that's there's always rewriting uh, that, after the that fact. Count back that you're talking about hooked me right off the bat. Yeah, I, well, I love the flow of it. I was like, that is ingenious. And then uh, you know, I I was just it was time for me. I my my last project I recorded uh, six songs, and uh, you know, uh, I think it was in 2018. And I typically release two songs a year. So I was like, oh, I was at the end of my bank. <laughs> so well, it was time to get time to get some more songs going. So I just asked the boys if it was okay to cut that one. And they were all, they were super stoked. And they sing on it. They're doing the, the backgrounds and harmonies. And uh, Aiden's playing the banjo and he did some production elements too. So it was really cool to have this guy's involved in the, in the final product. That's wicked. That is impressive. And like, I, I've been listening. I think there was one time me and you were actually on the Canadian Indie Country Countdown together. Oh, yeah. 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 And no was, doubt. And it was one of those moments where, like, if I heard your song, either mine was coming on right next to mm. it or right below it because we were always so close together. But it was, yeah, from that moment, I was like, wow, Doug, like, it's 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 got that quality to it and that meaning towards it. So it, you've been on the radar for a while for me. Oh, well, that's cool. Thanks for saying that. Yeah. Now, when uh, you're, are we gonna, oh, I was gonna say, are we gonna talk about uh, your your stuff now? We're, we're getting there very, very, very uh, close. Good. Teasing ever so slightly on the long. Yeah, way. yeah. When we when you have a song that you're considering releasing, what's the to do list in your head? What's the top priority for you for the music release? You mean after it's been recorded or during the yeah. recording? Like yeah, as as it's yeah. recorded, it's sitting in your hands, yeah. and you have the release date coming. Like what's going through mm -hmm. your head to for a release strategy? Um, well, for me, strategically, the um, I, we talked a little bit before you start recording, but what what is success for me? You know, mm -hmm. um, I I define my success maybe differently than than a mainstream uh, artist would. Is like uh, a Gord Baffert or Brett Kissel. You know, those guys are trying to to or Dallas Smith are trying to get in the uh, top of the charts and and fighting for that. But that's that's not really for me what I'm after. But um, I I kind of determined success being trying to get that that ad on Sirius XM and so what does it take to to get that and it's usually working with someone who you know I have a really good relationship with Julian but you know I just you know you, you just can't leverage that you know you can't just call up somebody cold hey just that and and that's just not cool it's not respectful to him either so um you can uh, go through a find a radio tracker someone who's mm -hmm. going to represent your song someone you know and trust and um um that's the kind of first thing is in, and make sure that <clears throat> they will, they will give you a checklist too. They'll really help you through this process. So, you know, yeah. do you have your, uh, there's specs, about the, there's a sheet of CanCon, you know, break down the writers and the publishers and how long the song is and 
the UPC number and the ISRC number. And so once you get all this stuff done, and then there's there's all kind of admin around that too, just registering it on Sound Exchange, make sure that it's all the stuff is taken care of um, from 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 the admin side, Absolutely. and then it's a matter of marketing. So, how are you going to market that song? How are you going to get that for your own level of success? Keep that in merit because what works for me may not work for you, or might not work for Emily Claire, or it might you know everybody has a different role at, of of what they are going to try to achieve in their own targets. So, I'm not looking for top hundred. <laughs> uh, I'd love to get top. I can't, I can't blame her. Did crack the top hundred. You know, it's always kind of like be nice if it happened, but mm-hmm. you know, to get the top hundred, you really need a lot of spins on reporting stations. So, um, and you need to to work that. It's either going to have the song is just going to be absolutely breakthrough song that people are just going to fall in love with, or you have to uh, feed the machine mm-hmm. uh, of the of the advertising and the marketing, and you need to do you know TikTok campaigns and user generated content videos and, and so there's all kinds of strategies and I'm not an expert on that so sometimes I um I'll I'll hire somebody like a marketing firm like ZYK Sarah has been helpful with me in the past so um it's like doing a I'm I can't engineer my own songs I go to a studio and get them recorded exactly you're good what I'm good at I'm good at I'm good at songwriting and I'm good at performing and I'm good at singing on my track, but I'm not good at engineering and mastering and, and putting all this stuff together. And, and same thing with marketing. I can do a little bit of marketing, but I will hire someone to market it. But and the budget depends on me and my level of success. You know, mm-hmm. Whether you're okay spending $500, or you want to spend 5000 or you want to spend 15000 yeah. It's really kind of be up to you. So um, uh, just general is like, there's experts for reasons. <laughs> really, you know, they're really good at what they do. Yeah, exactly. So it's a matter of finding people you're comfortable with and someone who's going to understand your goals and keep within your budget. So, mm-hmm. yeah. 100%. Now, not only are we friends through music, but I was pitched a song, actually quite a few that I absolutely loved. And to my surprise, after picking five songs, four of them were co-written by you. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> I didn't know they were all four. I, I, uh, uh yeah that, that's that's funny i know uh i know that you work with sean moore um mm-hmm. the producer and uh more music yeah more right music there. yeah yeah and, and and sean and i have had a you know had a really good working relationship where he'll he'll reach out and not just to me there's a bunch of other co-writers i work mm-hmm. with that he'll reach out to like guys like dave boris and whatever yep. like um when he needs pitch pitches for artists like yourself or an emily claire or whoever it might be mm-hmm. and we you know send him some songs that you know, he gives us a description and yeah. uh, happy, happy to pitch songs because we all have demos. Um, part of well, we, 100% of uh, the songs we, that we write are not with artists. And sometimes even if they are with artists, we, it may not work for them, mm-hmm. but they could work for someone else. Um, good songs, great songs may not work for somebody. Mm-hmm. Um like the house that built me was turned down for six years in Nashville. Like it was maybe even nine, like wow. people passed on that song over and over and over again. Yeah. And, and there's tons of stories like this. There's all kinds of reasons, like examples, mm-hmm. <clears throat> but the reason being is that you and I are not the same size guys. We go into a suit store and there's, there's Gucci and Armani and they're all good suits. Yeah. But what I pick for my, Maybe I'm going to, I'm going to a, a wedding or, and you're going to a funeral. Mm-hmm. So the styles and the cuts and the times and the seasons and the reasons are different. doesn't mean they're not quality and, and, and the songs can be quality. They're just not right for that mm-hmm. person at that time. So that's, that's why there's demos <laughs> that, and, and, and eventually at some point those demos, which are quality songs will land in hands of someone like yourself is looking for mm-hmm. just that right song that hits you and where you're at in your career and the type of song you want to release and the type of fans that you have, you know, there's, there's, there's always a fit, right? 100%. So the final pick came down and I chose spin that bottle. I actually chose yeah. alcohol you, but that was being done by somebody else at the moment. Yeah. That wasn't my song. It was must've been. Yeah. I'm not sure who was that one, but it might have been Anthony's. 
Yeah, um, I'm, or David. Yeah, alcohol. Yeah. You like university? Yeah, that's funny. If you yeah. don't come, anyway, I'm not gonna spoil yeah. it because I don't know who the artist <laughs> is playing it. So, yeah. <laughs> but anyways, it was co-written by yourself, Andrew Fiddler, and David Boris. First yeah. off, thank you for allowing me to record this song. I cannot wait for people to hear it. I've given you a snippet of it every single step of the way while we've mm, been doing yeah. it. Yeah, I am so excited with it. I produced it with Sean Moore, who's up for CMAO nominee of producer of the year. Uh, yeah. Hit, hit, nudge, nudge, people. This song is Hope catchy. for Sean. Absolutely. This song is catchy from start to finish, but I really, really want to break down this song because I want to hear the story behind it. And I want to know everything about this track. How was the well, song? <laughs> yeah, the tap in the memory banks here. Yeah, and um, I know. I, I, I yeah. also saw the copyright on it, but. Yeah, no, it was a few years ago, but um, we we loved it right away. Um, I I'm I'm not certain who had the title. Like I, whether it was mine, it was probably mine or David's. Usually we bring the titles in, but um, I had I, these guys, uh, Anthony and David. We had a stand, and uh, we would write. Initially, we were writing for like a couple of years every week, every week, maybe every couple of weeks. But we call our writing the West Coast Express because we're all those are Vancouver guys. And that was a that was a line on the Canucks back in the day. So we were the West Coast Express and we would get together and, and just try to write uh, songs for the market. And um, we've been pretty successful with some of the stuff that we've done. I mean, I'm no one bats 100, but we, we most of the songs that we've written that, that we that got demoed, we made. Not everything you write is demo. We have to decide what you're going to invest in because there's, there's there you have to make an investment. Um, luckily, though, Anthony, what he was bringing to the table, he's an he's a producer. Um, David and I are are, are um, and Anthony, we're 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 the strong writers, and Anthony he helps a lot because he knows music and production and uh, what you know the lifts and pieces. You know, he yeah. he has a he brings a lot as a writer, um, but we do primarily like lyric stuff i you know and uh so everybody has their strengths and that's another thing about finding co-writers is you find people to work with that are good at stuff that you're not <laughs> and uh, then you can round it out so for me i'm a lyric first melody second guy i can do melody but um primarily my strength is lyric yeah and um so anyway i'm not sure who had the title but with this song it's been that bottle i mean it pretty well says what it is you start yeah. thinking about it but what we wanted to do <clears throat> was to create the music video with the lyric, like so that you just have to hear it to see it all. That we wanted to make all the pictures as vivid and as clear as possible. And I think it that's what I love about this song so much is that there's not a there's no fluff in this song no. that isn't every line has got an image that you can see or you can smell or you you've been there you've been in that sh basement um den with a shag carpet and 100%. you know stealing a little bit of booze from it, dad it whatever, not be whatever southern but whatever it was yeah 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 we were, we were trying to think about you know the picking the bottle to spin that was uh, we had a lot of debate about what kind of <laughs> what kind of bottle it would be right yeah and we said well you know this song's really kind of um catered to teenagers mm -hmm. and we we're all like well you know what did you drink when you were a teenager you, you hard alcohol was 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 rough yeah like you didn't have a taste for it i mean i, I love whiskey and bourbon now but when i was 17 or 18 i no I, no no thank you <laughs> <laughs> so we thought well southern comfort is sweet and ev like kind of sweet and then everybody would have like guys and girls or ever said so, like it's something that's not great, but it's tolerable. Yeah. So that's what we ended up. We ended up spending a lot of time debating on the bottle, <laughs> what kind of booze <laughs> it was going to be. <laughs> Again, we just want it to be authentic. That is and, awesome. Uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, that's that was one of the one of the things that went around. But Anthony built the track after we were finished. But um, I didn't Fantastic think my job. I didn't think my voice was going to suit that. And like I do my stuff well, my music, and I've got a thing. And I'm a, I'm a tenor, which is kind of on the higher end. I got more of a high register singing voice, which is great in live bar, in bars because it cuts through. But yeah. it's not the middle of the road country stuff. So um, I got my buddy in in Nashville, Troy Castellano, who uh, he sings on the demo. He's he's a fantastic artist and writer down there, and. So once we had the track done, uh, we just sent him, sent him the files. He's got a home, a really awesome home studio, and um, and he 
he cut the song. I think Anthony put the harmonies on it uh, himself. Anthony does a lot of the harmony singing, but yeah. So that's, that's how your, your demo came to be and how the song got written. So um, yeah, I went from a title to uh, a moving picture show debating over the bottle and then, uh, and then turned into the demo and, and the, that you that finally got to you. That, it's made a long journey. That demo was insane. Oh, I, well, it, I, now the recording that you sent me is insane. So I, I can't wait for it to come out. So <laughs> when's, well, your, when, when's your release date? It's my coming up soon, date right? It's April 7th. April 7th. Yeah. Fantastic. I'm go through Distro Kid for the production of it. So uh, it's, it's, it's going to be in fun. All right. Incredible. Cool. April 7th. And you're going to be um, pushing that to radio or just to uh, digital? Or what, nope, what's your plan there? We're going radio and digital. So perfect so um, i'm hoping that you get to turn on sirius xm one yeah yeah hear this song just blasted away oh that's right yeah i can't wait it'll be fantastic yeah. again I, uh, just like you i have the contact with julian but when it comes down to it i'd rather say hi to julian and how his day is going rather than pitch him a song so I yeah i mean he um he's like everybody else you know they they, they get to the position where they're at uh, for reasons mm-hmm. and um the last thing that they, they want to, they want a relationship with artists rather than a, Hey, can you do this for me? Yeah. Then a business type of thing. Right. So, um, and they, you know, just to, if there's too much, they, they'll like change their email. Yeah. <laughs> and so yeah, it wasn't then, block you and you'll never yeah. hear from them again. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Right. So yeah, 100%. now when you pitch songs or when you have them pitched out to you, do you give the artist free creativity or do you kind of have your own style of how you'd like this song to already be? Oh, no. Uh, yeah. The demo is simply that it's a demonstration. Um, what is the copyright part of it is the, is a lyric and melody, right? That's the only thing that's really that you, that you create. So production wise, it can be produced lots of different ways. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's also, you know, there's a fair bit of room in the melody choices as well. Um, but there's, you know, there's usually something that's central, um, the essence of the melody. So when an artist would like to change those kind of things, usually they'll reach out and, and, and with the lyric changes or tweak, yeah. They're like, hey, is it okay if we change that? And uh, usually with lyric, I like to see what the lyric's going to be. So I ask them, like, send me, send me your suggested change. Mm-hmm. And then all the co-writers have to agree on that and sign off on that. And um, so that's typically how it does. There's nothing worse than getting back a track that's got a bunch of changes that you didn't know about. Yeah. Because that, that's really, uh, that's not cool. Um, but it doesn't happen very often. Um, it happened earlier in my career, but as you, like we talked about, you know, getting into those doors, but as you working with different levels of people to those, those, those kind of, I, I don't know, they call them innocent mistakes or rookie mistakes. They don't happen uh, as often. Right. So. Yeah. Fair enough. And I mean, like if we're being 100% honest, there was nothing I, wanted to change and spin that bottle from the second i heard the demo it was yeah uh, but you know the, for sure I, I i would always just like if it was completely ch- changed like we know the demo may not be in your key like mm-hmm. so you, you know you, ha- you have to re- that's the one thing is like this is just we try to get something that's middle of the road but you can change the key yeah you can change it the flavor um i've had some songs that have been recorded four times now same song cut four times okay so like uh one with like a male vocal and then female vocals, uh, bluegrass version. So it's all the same song. And uh, that's the beautiful thing about writing a song is that the lyric is the same and the melody is the same, but the production is so different. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, ah, oh, it's, it's so good. It's so refreshing to hear different songs done differently. And I mean, I, yeah. that would give you a good sense of gratitude too, that you can cater to those types of people with just one song as well. There, well, I mean, that's that's one thing. You know, gratitude is a great word. Um, I work with a, I work with a life coach, a music life coach. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll give her a plug here, Joanne Jansen uh, out hey, of Alberta. She also same it, one, yes. Yeah, yeah, I work with her, and uh, you know, we talk about gratitude, and and I think often as writers, as creatives, we we crave that gratitude. Mm-hmm. We, we we have to give gratitude and, and be thankful for things, but. We also, maybe it's not much gratitude. It's, um, um, 
credibility, I guess, when like, you know, I guess recognition. Yeah. And when, when, when someone records a song, it feels so good when they choose your song, because they could choose a thousand songs, they mm-hmm. choose your song and then they choose to invest in it, record it and spend, you know, all these, the love and the energy into like what you did with Sean, you know, you guys built this thing up from the ground is blank computer screen and then turns into a single, um, you know, a couple months later, and then it's going to go to radio and you, you know, you, you get your team behind this, your fans behind this, and you're playing it live. I mean, as a writer, there's nothing better than, than seeing that commitment to something that we, my coder writers and I create it yeah. out of thin air. You know, it's just, it's so gratifying. Uh, we have a gratified gra- gratitude, but it's a gratifying is, is what that is. Yeah. You know, it, it just, um, yeah, that's one of the, the most beautiful things of, of, of writing, being a songwriter is, is, is having people believe in your songs, invest in your songs, sing them. And, uh, I mean, I've got so much more that I want to do as a writer, like my own goals. And, and uh, you know, Brenda and I went to, um, I took her to see George Strait in, we went to Tacoma. And I think it was on his 60, 60 and 60. He had a 60th hit, number one song. He, he was yeah. turning 60. So this place, the Tacoma Dome, is is this massive venue. And he's playing in the round. So there's, I don't know, 60,000 people in here. It's just, it's just gong show. But everything he's singing is a hit. And the crowd is singing along mm-hmm. to these songs. And I'm like, it's great for George, but I'm thinking about the writers. Yeah. Can you imagine those songwriters sitting in a little room in a cubby hole somewhere in Nashville or Texas or wherever they were, imagining that someday, and it's just one night on a string of nights that mm-hmm. he's playing, and there's all these people have been affected by that song that was created in those few hours and singing along. And it's like, I just looking around, I was like, you know, that's the kind of impact of a song that I would like to write one day. Yeah. Like that's my goal is to write a hit song. That's going to be part of someone's identity mm-hmm. and part of those people's lives Those thousands of people, like for hundreds of thousands of people in some cases for, you know, George Strait songs, you know, it's like, yeah, it's immense. I mean, I, I feel that, um, you know, you said impressive resume and all that. I was like, I'm just getting started. Like, I mean, I, I'm, I'm happy with what I, I'm very proud of what I've done. I'm proud of how, how far I've got, but that's not where that's I'm not finished. I'm not finished. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. 100%. I, um, yeah, no, there's, when you were talking about like the songwriting and having George Strait, I actually recall having a conversation um, with a lady named Jordy Lynn and she was telling me about this uh, documentary on Amazon prime. And it's not available in Canada, unfortunately. Okay. But uh, it's, I think it's called, it all started with a song or something like that. And it, it showcases Nashville songwriters. And it's the same kind of concept where I wrote this song for Taylor Swift. And I wrote this song 20 years ago. And it mm-hmm. finally, Taylor Swift picks it up. And now everybody in the world knows the lyrics mm-hmm. to the song that I wrote one day with yeah. one of the toughest breakups of my life or whatever. Like, it's, yeah to hear the actual story behind the song i feel is almost as important as hearing why the artist chose to do this song yeah no for sure i mean there are you know people write songs for lots of reasons um and the main reason is you feel better when you're doing it you feel better when you're done like it's just it's even paul mccartney talks about that you know it's like yeah feeling down is me strum a little bit you'll, you'll feel better you know? Yeah. you know so it's whether that's going through that breakup that you talked about or if it's just like man let's get together with my buddies you know like it's mm-hmm. a that's great let's get together every every thursday night with buck 20 we we bullshit and talk and have a good laugh and then we get yeah. get to down and we'll write write a song and like oh that's fun and and sometimes you explore that emotions and get them out there and and uh you never know where it's going to go like mm-hmm. um I, I worked with Larry Wayne Clark for a lot of years. Larry was one of the guys that he, he was a professional songwriter. He took me under, under his wing really early in my career before I got my publishing deal. Like uh, Larry was instrumental from, for my development, but um, Larry had cuts with Lee Greenwood, and, uh, Buddy Jewel and Chris Young. And, you know, he had a lot, lot, lots of success, but um, he would say that your songs are like children they're going to go out in the world and they're going to do their own thing. <laughs> some are going to do wonderful things. <laughs> some that you have a lot of hope in are going to do nothing because <laughs> this is what happens. You, 
we, we we get caught up in hope, right? You know, and even you for yourself, you get your own single coming out here. It's like, man, we have these expectations and hopes and dreams that, ah, man, maybe it's just going to take off. And um, so we have to condition ourselves to disappointment as as creatives because um, there's lots of no's and there's lots of, well, I didn't quite meet my expectations or I didn't go the way I wanted it to, but there's no such thing as a, as a, as a success story that doesn't have some strife and failure and climb along the way. The climb is the best part of the story. There's, oh, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Well, even, even the unknowns, like who knows, there could be somebody that comes out with a song that sounds almost like yours or has the same kind of vibe to them. And now you have to choose between those. And it was unbeknownst to you, you two both just decided to work on a, a song together and have the exact same release date. Like yeah, no, for sure. The, the the titles get used a lot. You'll, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's so interesting. I'll I'll have a song, and, or you know, we get demoed up, and yeah, I'm just getting ready to start pitching it, and then you'll see the same title on Sirius XM. And uh, I remember uh, this. Uh, yeah, I mean, there was a Shotgun Rider. I think I had a song called Shotgun Rider. Then Tim McGraw had like, yep. it's like, I haven't even put this out. How does he have that title? And then, right. and then a few, you know, whatever, 15 years later, Tebe did it, you know, same thing. It didn't matter. You, you can, you, oh, yeah. <laughs> sometimes yeah. you can use, use them again, but um, yeah, it happens a lot. It mm-hmm. happens often. Well, even me, like uh, Tim Albertson, gonna get loud. Tim mm-hmm. Hicks, get loud. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So uh, it's unfortunate coincidence. Unfortunately, but, it didn't go my way, but uh, yeah, uh, in it, the nature of music, there's only so many notes. Um, you know, there's only so many notes in the scale, there's only so many chords, there's only there's only, but there's ways to always be creative and ways to break through. Because you talked about uh, before we get on here, we're talking about summer of '69. Yeah, that song was of a generation, mm-hmm. you can still write a today's generation may not have a summer of 69. You can write the new version that's going to be of that. Like yeah, it, music right. often recreates themselves as echoes and harmonies of what it did in the past. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so don't be afraid to explore something that was big in the past because t- today's listeners different. They, they, they are going to need something that's going to be theirs. Yeah. They don't want summer of 69. That's not theirs. That's their parents. That, that was their parents. Song. Yeah. Yeah the hell with that and brian adams who's he you know <laughs> see that hurts my heart in a way but i know i know i know but i just but you know it, it, i think someone was talking about like with lone star and they talk about these big wedding songs that lone star did right it's like mm-hmm. but that was lone that was my parents or you know whoever and, my and now luke yeah. combs feels like yeah exactly someone else is going to take yeah luke combs going to fill out or chris young like someone else has got those songs like mm-hmm. um so it's okay to write those things again so fair enough that's unfortunate that you and uh, tim hicks had the same thing at the same time but great minds think alike man (laughs) (laughs) i've had it happen a few times where i've written a song and then next thing you know like uh i have a song out on youtube that i haven't released yet that uh sean and me are gonna work on but it's called if you can see or yeah if you can see me now and yeah. uh, Luke Combs came out with a song the week after called Hope You See Me Now. And it's, <laughs> and it's literally almost identical word for word. Of, yeah. Like he's he's thanking everybody. I'm thanking everybody. And I'm just like, yeah, well, what can you yeah. do? Yeah. Oh, goodness. Oh, that sucks. <laughs> but what can you do? What can you do? Yeah. Right? So, Doug, what kind of advice would you give for somebody that's wanting to follow in your footsteps? Well, I don't know if I want anybody to follow in my footsteps, but uh, um. It, I don't know if people are, and I've really noticed like in, in Canada, there's a lot more people writing. Uh, when I first started out, there was like a, you know, a few dozen of us that were kind of doing it seriously, but there's so many people doing it now. And I think it's, uh, I think it's great. Cause it's just bringing up um, the whole, everybody's rising as a tide in Canada and it's being competitive with what's going on. Um, Cause it's not a secret about how to do it. You just gotta, you gotta do it to start off. You gotta do it. You do do a lot. Mm-hmm. repetition it's like going to the gym and doing reps you know uh, you, you gotta write 500 crappy songs as soon as possible um i was often said like is it going to an old farmhouse no one's lived in for a bunch of years and running the tap it's going to be rusty yep. and let all that rusty water run out but you're going to get some stuff in there you're going to get you're going to get 
uh, an understanding of what works. You, more importantly, you get an understanding of what doesn't work and why things don't work. Mm -hmm. You know, like getting your pronouns correctly, you know, just tenses and all kinds of things in here, you know, writing to the hook, but you have to write, you have to do a lot of it. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta get through it. Um, with that though, you're going to build relationships and connections. Mm -hmm. um, besides just building those skills, you could get a catalog, you might get a few cuts and this is going to get you the places where you're okay to ask, you know, I, it's all right. I can ask Aaron Goodwin to write with me because I've written 500 songs, yeah. you know, you just gotta, you gotta do it. You got the dedication. If you really want to do it, that's the first part. And then find your team because co-writing is like, is like dating is that you'll find people that it doesn't work with, you know, it's like not everybody's going to be right for yeah. you. Um, yeah. They're just not, not, not a good, maybe you're, and they can not be right because they're, they're in the same vein as you did. We do the same thing. Why, mm -hmm. you know, so why do we need to, so it doesn't mean that they're not uh, good people, but uh, maybe you're just too similar in the skills. So you're not complimenting each other. You just, almost redundant. So, yeah. yeah. So find, find good people. Um, and I would also just recommend that people, if you're writing country songs, just listen for hooks and write them down because most of country music is conversational mm -hmm. tone. Like it's, if you wouldn't, if you don't want to say it, you shouldn't sing it. Like if, if it's something you wouldn't say to your yeah. girlfriend, you really shouldn't sing it. Like, that. It, you know, in the way that, so um, listen to dialogue and find snippets of dialogue that make you pique your interest mm -hmm. and, and just write it down on your phone. And then when you get to a writing session, you may not know how you're going to write it, but like read it out, bounce it off your co-writers. They may think of something, Hey, you know, that hits me this way and, and describe how it, how was it used in that scene in the movie? Like, what were they talking about? Yeah. Like what? And uh, yeah, for example, I have one a little while ago called uh, Slow Burn. I wrote down my phone, Slow Burn, and, and we ended up writing a song. But the, the conversation was, you know, I knew it was you. You you were my slow burn. Like, you were the one that got me right away. Yeah. And then you got me way down the road. Like, you know, you were there, always there, always there. And then realized that I loved you, that kind of thing. But I love you. so, but you just, just keep your ears open. And uh, so that's, they, that's where great songs come from is dialogue. Oh, that's incredible. Oh, you've given so much insight in the last hour that we've been sitting here chit-chatting, Doug. That, that this is another one of those ones where I'm literally going to have to sit here and listen and listen and listen. <laughs> and listen. Oh, goodness. The, the first four plays of this bot of this freaking podcast will be just me on repeat. I hope you do it on two and a half times. <laughs> yeah, listen to it fast. So we've talked about the stuff that you've done previously, all the songwritings that you've done, the song that you have released now, sir. What is next for you? Well, hopefully a bunch of hit songs. Um, million dollars. No, no, um, yeah, I, I mean, I do have another single that's coming out this year. I told you I record it too. So I, I have another one that will be coming out sometime in late summer, early fall. It's called uh, When It Comes to Whiskey. And uh, yeah, I wrote that with Anthony Fiddler and Chris Bryan. Chris is, uh, he's an Alberta artist. He came, came from BC, but he's, he's working out of Alberta right now. And uh, so that'll be coming later, later this year. It's all wrapped up and, um, and, and it, it's, fun. it's a fun little song, a drinking song as, as, as you will. Um, yeah. And a bunch of cuts coming out. I got your, your song coming. I'm really excited about um, a band, the Rural Roots. It's a song coming out, uh, I think on the 28th called um whiskey lie and uh jaron friesen um he's this kind of an outlaw country artist from uh manitoba mm -hmm. and we i wrote a song with quentin blair that he cut called uh outlaw in my blood that comes out on april 1st and uh I, i'm really excited about this girl B brooklyn blackmore out of nova scotia she cut a song we wrote together called paint the sky that's coming out this summer that i'm uh I, i'm i'm uh I'm anxious to hear hit the airwaves as well. So lots of cool things coming down the pipe and for myself, i um, playing more live shows now that the COVID yeah. restrictions have been yeah. lifted. Absolutely. I played a show last night and I have another one tonight. And so, you know, things are starting to book up and awesome. that's going to be fun. Yeah. So for new fans of yours that want to know all about you or for some artists that might want to shoot, shoot the shit with you and try and get onto a <laughs> songwriting session with you, where can they find your social medias at? Yeah, well, I have a website, dougfolkins.com, and it has links to my Facebook and Instagram from, from there. So um, 
or you can just you can just search me out on Instagram. It's uh, Falcons Doug, and on Facebook it's Doug Falcons Music. Yeah, and uh, yeah, for sure, reach out. And all my all the streaming platforms are carrying uh, streaming the single. So beautiful. So please, yeah. please, please share that. <laughs> Doug, thank you so so much for joining me today. Hey, thanks so much, Tim, for having me, man. This is uh, you've been in depth questions and uh, lots of fun banter, and like I said, we got into a few wormholes, and <laughs> it was good. <laughs> That's perfectly fine. I love figuring out stuff like that because, like, there is a lot that I want to understand about this whole music industry. I'm still very green to it. Um, I've been singing since I was seven, but not necessarily in the industry for that long. Yeah. So to learn everything about the songwriting and to all the aspects like that, like thank you so much for the insight. Um, I mean, good luck with your music, man. I was just I was telling you before we started, I, I you you really connect with audiences. Your your live show is, um, yeah, it's off the charts. People really really react to you and what you bring to them, and I I, I know they're gonna like your your new song, and I, can't, we, I can't wait to see some videos that you post to you playing that live. So that's uh, something I'm really looking forward to. There is one show that I cannot announce yet, but it's huge. Okay, and good. The, fa- the fact that I get to play Spin That Bottle on that stage is gonna be <laughs> absolutely incredible. Cool. I'll be watching for that, too. Oh, man. I really, really hope I do this song justice for you, Doug. Thank you so much. I cannot wait to meet you very, very shortly. You bet. We'll see you soon. Thank absolutely. you.